but yeah, let's uh, start off a little bit about me. Um, I've been an amateur probably, I think, I don't know, four or five years, not not too long compared to most people here. Um, but I'm part of AREG, EMDRC, and um, founder of Pride Radio Group. Um, and a little bit about this talk. Uh, it's probably about a year ago, actually, uh, just over a year that we went on um, the CSR uh, trip that took us essentially all around the country. Um, but it, that's not the only trip we do. We uh, do lots of trips around the, the place. Um, over last Christmas, we did the, the high country. Um, and um, in the in the future, we're planning Simpson and Cape York and that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, let's kick off. Um, first up, I uh, just want to mention that like a lot of the topics I'm covering today are like talks entirely of their own sort of thing. So I'm just lightly going to touch on a whole bunch of um, different things. Um, my partner runs a YouTube channel, Drop Table uh, Adventures, that's documented some of our journeys, not just the radio side of things, but where we go, a little bit of the, the history of the, the places, lots of little interesting things, some car things. It's got a little bit of everything um, and uh, well documented our CSR trip. Um, but yeah, so what am I talking about? Like overlanding, um, it's you know, driving around our country and seeing it, um, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't like using like four wheel driving because a lot of the time we aren't actually four wheel driving, we're just driving somewhere and, you know, visiting a place or we're walking or we're, you know, exploring. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of these places are quite remote, um, which makes sort of radio and amateur radio quite interesting. But yeah, uh, throughout the talk, I've got some QR codes. I'll also link the slides. I'll try and get them up on the AREG mailing list um, and I'll maybe send you uh, Hayden a, a link that you can drop in the video as well. Um, but yeah, uh, check out Drop Table Adventures if you want to see some of these uh, adventures in more detail. But like, why does communication come up in these sort of trips? Well, this is the Telstra cell phone coverage map. This is a year old, but um, it probably hasn't changed too dramatically uh, since then. And we can see that like, the vast populated areas have pretty good coverage. But as soon as you get into the center of Australia, uh, we start to have uh, some issues. Um, so if we have a look at our CSR trip and overlay that on there, you notice that pretty much the entire trip has no cell phone coverage at all. So uh, communication's really, really uh, important. So, you know, this is a trip that takes, I think it took us about two weeks. Um, other people do it faster, some people do it slower. Uh, but communication, really, really important. Um, and sort of as Australians, we know that communication is important. Like we've got the RFDS. Um, uh, you know, we've put a lot of effort into making the RFS, RFDS work, and it's a really sort of critical and important part of it, Australia um, and sort of pioneering some of the use cases for, for HF radio. Um, uh, we know like things like PLBs save lives all the time. Um, anyone who's gone in, into sort of remote areas is known to, you know, take a sat phone and, and that. And we know that amateur radios even save people. Um, so it's it's super important. But I'm going to start this talk off not talking about amateur radio because um, I love you all. You're all amazing. Um, and I care about you all. Um, and I think it's really important that we don't treat amateur radio as a um, safety net. Like if it's the last thing that we have, definitely, definitely use it. Um, but we should be prepared in other ways first. Um, it should be seen as sort of a, a last resort. We don't want to rely on it, um, especially when we're going into these remote locations. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. You know, like none of the operators are really trained. It's amateur by nature. Um, we experiment. You know, the ionosphere could be doing something weird. The sun can be angry. Um, and that's not really a good thing when you're in an emergency situation. You want to make sure that you can get the help that you need. So what are some options before we get into amateur radio um, that I think you should consider? Um, probably my top pick if you're doing a lot of these remote trips or if you like hiking, um, 
consider getting a PLB. These things about four hundred dollars, but they last like I think they're like eight years, ten years. Um, you have to register them, but they have a, a GPS position in them, and they beacon to satellite, and they've got a, a direction finding beacon as well. Um, this is probably like the easiest thing that you can do. These things are, are tiny; they're you know about that big, um, so you can carry them in your pocket essentially, or on a belt. Um, this is definitely where I'd start. Uh, these I think are super important. So someone in your group of people that's you know going on these remote trips should have one of these. Uh, the important thing with these are is the people coming to rescue you are rescuing you. They're only rescuing you. They're not rescuing your vehicle. They're not rescuing your pets. They're not rescuing any of your stuff. They only care about getting you back to a safe place. Um, so that's no good if you, you know, break down and you want to, you know, recover your car, those kind of scenarios. So the next thing I would consider is the Garmin InReach platform. This is a bit more pricier uh, and has a subscription fee, but this kind of works like a SMS email kind of uh, thing. Um, I prefer these over sat phones because sat phones have like a big latency in talking. It can be quite hard. They're also quite expensive to have like a phone call. These on the other hand, uh, quite compact, very useful, uh, has a bunch of other features like being able to check the weather. So definitely check these out. Um, and then there is the sat phone option. These are kind of pricey in terms of the hardware, but also the ongoing costs, the subscription fees and the phone calls. Um, and as I said, it can be quite hard to communicate if the people that you're talking to aren't used to uh, talking on a sat phone. Sat phone. Uh, it has, uh, like, it has a like a one a second one... La latency. Uh, I think, so. oh, yeah. cool. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is VKS737. Um, so this is a HF service, but you've got trained people. We've got tons of stations. They're operating on a ton of different frequencies. They've got cell call. Um, they're quite useful. So check those out. Uh, you will need a, a supported radio that will work. Um, and there is a subscription fee. It's not much. It's $144. So if you want something and you've already got a radio that will work with VKS737, that's definitely something to look at. Um, and there is some value about uh, with non-emergencies as well. They've got SCADs and you can talk to other VKS737 people as well. So then... What can we do with amateur radio then? Um, well, we've got a few different options. Um, one thing is we're going into remote places, so our noise floor is quite low. This makes operating satellites super easy. Uh, you can hear satellites um, just on rubber ducky antennas, uh, and it's amazing. Um, you've also got a low noise floor for HF, so that's always good fun to, to operate. We've got a ton of different modes. The ones I've listed here are voice. Uh, we use APRS heavily, which we'll see, um, and using things like WinLink to do uh, email over over HF radio. Um, all very non-emergency things, but very useful. Later on, I'll get into some more like fun things as well. So why is that fun? Well, the nose floor, beautiful. It's really fun. Um, it's really nice actually it's like standing outside there's no light pollution and you can see the ISS going across being able to see the ISS while it's going across makes it very easy to track um, but some downsides to this is um, you might not have footprints that line up with the people that you want to don't uh, that you want to talk to um, You'll need some SCEDs in Australia often because satellites are very underutilized. Please use satellites more. They're amazing and good fun. Um, and the other thing is on longer trips, it's a bit harder to keep the TLEs updated. So uh, after you know a week or so, the satellite's position has changed from where you expect it to be. Um, so it can be hard to keep that, that up to date. But on short trips, this is definitely something um, that I find fun. Um, just bringing the um, the arrow antenna along and and having some fun on just FM sats is is excellent. Uh, but what we 
do a lot more with our overlanding is um, HF. Uh, so we fit everything in our car. So we do have to be a bit mindful about space. Um, and we like to use our radios uh, often uh, while we're driving. So we've remote headed uh, both the radios that we use, a code 9323 and an ICOM 7100. Um, and the other thing to think about with like HF on a car is your antenna is going to be quite small. Uh, so you need to make sure you have as much power as you can output. So both our radios, in theory, should output 100 watts. I'm not sure if the code 9323 still outputs 100 watts. I think it's a little bit less now. But um, yeah, the shack in the box radios work really uh, well, uh, like the ICOM 7100. With the USB port on it, it makes it very, very easy to interface with the digital modes. Um, but in terms of uh, connecting those radios up into like uh, making them useful, we've got antennas. Um, so we do two things on our car. We've got the auto tuning 9350 uh, Coden antenna with the big long whip. And that's sort of our general purpose radio. So we use that for making voice contacts and uh, checking emails and stuff on the go. Uh, and then we have uh, monoband uh, center loaded antennas, the HF30CL. Um, and we treat these as consumables because we know they're going to get destroyed. They're going to hit a tree. They're going to snap. Uh, there's some sort of design issues with the HF30CL that don't make it so great for um, for four-wheel driving. Um, but we sort of live with that and just replace them when they, when they break. Uh, then the next sort of problem is if we're doing these digital modes like WinLink, um, we need a way of sort of interfacing between the radio and um, uh, like a Raspberry Pi. So we use a Raspberry Pi in our, uh, our computer uh, as our sort of computer inside the car. Uh, you can just use a laptop as well, um, but you do need that that interface. So the, for the ICOM 7100, it's easy. You've just got that USB port. You plug it in. You don't have to worry. Uh, for the 9323, uh, we use a DigiRig. We've actually moved the DigiRig to inside the 9323 enclosure. So it's possibly the only uh, 9323 that has a USB interface, which is kind of fun. Um, but the DigiRig provides like serial, your PTT, uh, and your audio, so everything to interface. And they're quite small. Um, and affordable. So they're my sort of go-to for interfacing with radios. Um, so there's some other options for antennas and placement. So when we're doing the CSR trip, uh, we required a sand flag so people can see us crossing the dunes. Um, this is a big long stick with a flag on it. And a big long stick is only a little bit of copper wire away from being an antenna. Um, so we turned that into an antenna. It was a bit fiddly to sort of tune, and the tuning goes a little bit wobbly as the antenna, as the sand flag's moving around. But it worked surprisingly well. We got a lot of APRS packets out of that. So there's a QR code there to scan for instructions on how to build a sand flag antenna. Um, but sort of around that is, that was mounted onto the bull bar, and uh, it's okay for the sand flag antenna, but a lot of the other antennas, um, the bull bar is probably the worst mechanically um, place to put an antenna, just because the vibrations of the engine um, and the design, which just mean it will rattle uh, and put a lot of vibration stresses on those. So I got a picture down the bottom left there of what I found recently. I went to take the antenna off and the PL259 connector just snapped into. Um, so that was lucky that didn't happen while we we're driving. But yeah, these things um, these things happen uh, when you mount them on the bull bar. We still mount them on the bull bar because it's convenient. Um, and that's why we treat the antennas as consumables. So we have a couple of spares in the car at all times. And I think we went through probably two and a half antennas on our big CSR trip um, and around Australia. So uh, yeah, just keep that in mind. So the other problem you have when you're driving around is cars make a lot of HF noise now. Um, you know, we've got a diesel engine in our car, but it still makes a bunch of 
noise because it has injectors. It's got all the computer stuff. It's got everything else. Uh, it's got a brake pump. All of these things make um, HF noise. So there's a patent pending confidential thing that I'm just going to share with you. Don't tell anyone. Everyone on YouTube, don't tell anyone. It is super secret. We just get the world's biggest ferrite, like the world's biggest ferrite, and just clip it, just a clip on one, really big clip on one, and put it around the entire car. I think that might just work. Um, but if that doesn't, and if um, ferrite doesn't decide to, to build this giant ferrite for us, um, we've got a few other solutions. So we do have ferrites in ge general, so anything electrical inside the car, you could snap these on. Chances are you're going to find things like injectors um, or uh, your sort of ignition system is going to be probably the noisiest sort of places. Um, but there's a few other things you can do, such as bonding all the panels. Um, the exhaust system sort of acts as a big antenna. Um, you can bond all the things that you want. The other thing you can do, really simple, is if you've got skeds and stuff lined up, just turn the car off. Just park up somewhere. You know, you're on this nice cruisy holiday. Just stop for a few minutes, have your QSO, carry on. Um, it's a lot easier than dealing with all the all the HF noise in the car. Um, but you can at least lower it. Um, so we have conversations all the time while we're driving around. Um, listen out on 7045 um, lower side band, and there's usually someone chatting on there. Um, the other thing to think about is when you're doing these big trips off-road, you're going to have a lot of damage just in general, not even like amateur radio stuff, um, stuff's going to break. But in terms of amateur radio, you have things like connectors come loose. We had big problems with like the 3.5 millimeter plugs on the digi rigs. They seem to eventually loosen their way out. So we've, in some of our setups, we've soldered the audio cables directly onto the digi rig board and removed the 3.5 uh, millimeter connector. So, you know, eliminating the problem is a good start. Um, antennas uh, will loosen themselves over time, um, or alternatively, they'll tighten themselves over the time. And when you get home, you won't be able to remove them. Uh, you have things like um, the foliage will bend antennas. So all of our antennas have kinks and bends in them. It's fine. Um, and things like the radio mount, like the mount that we have for our 7100, it lost its screw about four times. Um, uh, it's all bent and <laughs> that sort of stuff. So my suggestions around that some of this stuff is make it accessible and easy to fix. So you can, if you can identify the problem um, and fix it easily, then that's sometimes as good as, uh, as anything else. Um, so we try and make our radios quite accessible and easily to easy to get to so we can fix things and it's good because all of this stuff is experimental and you anyway so often you want to pull stuff out change things put stuff back in um, you can use things like lock lock tight for screws if you really want things to stay in um, and the other thing is and uh, this is just in general have pre-start checks so for us when we're doing the csr trip we'll check things like our cv boots our batteries um you know, do we have all the fluids in the car, but would also do a pre-start check on our radio system. So it would make sure that APRS was transmitting. Um, in the morning, we'll check our wind link emails. Um, we'll do all that sort of st stuff before we headed off. So we at least knew when we left, it was in a working state. And you can also do that check when you get uh, to camp, when you, when you stop as well. So the only way you can find what's going to be a problem is just by testing. So just go on these trips, start with small trips, then work your way up to larger trips. Um, but yeah, it's good fun. So then what do we do with all the stuff that we've got in our car? Uh, the simplest thing is voice skeds. Uh, arranging this with buddies ahead of time. Um, you know, the important thing is, is you want to tell them like, you know, what frequency are you going to be listening on? and um, and what time, you know, this is a frequency, this is the time. Uh, you do have to think about position a bit. So if you're doing a big long trip like ours was from Victoria to WA, uh, you're going to be moving through those different hops. So, you know, 40 meters could work at the start of the trip, 
but then you want to move to 20 meters or you know a different band depending on what the conditions are or you might want to change when the sked is um and having uh people who are sort of familiar with like web sdrs and that can help a lot uh because if their noise floor is quite high yours is yours is a you're in the middle of nowhere so you don't have a problem but you want to make sure that their their noise floor is the equivalent and once you've got that it's uh pretty pretty easy and reliable to have a sked sort of every day um just set up that time and that frequency and as you move around uh just think about what other frequencies you might need to switch to as you get further and further away it's also um able to get co uh, in contact while driving um so there's a couple of options you can just leave the radio on a specific frequency tell the person hey i'm always listening on this frequency but you probably don't want to be listening to static for you know eight hours of a day uh so there's different options for that at least on the icom 7800 there's um, two options that i know about which is the power level squelch and that just unsquelches when the the rf input gets past a certain point there's also vsc um, which tries to be a little bit smarter um Honestly, I found power level squelch better, to be honest. Um, just set that to sort of where your noise floor is and you're good to go. Um, and there's carrier operated discriminator anti noise, uh, which you might know from code and radios. That's, um, that's code and for you. Um, that's a fancy name for the voice mute on, on their radios and their name. So. The other thing that we do and love is APRS. Um, in Australia, 30 meters uh, APRS is very, very popular. Um, we use a Raspberry Pi, some software called Direwolf, and a, any HF radio will work, uh, but we use a Coden 9323. Um, one thing I kind of want to promote inside amateur radio with APRS is not just treating it as a this is my this is how I get my position online, but also treating it as a two way thing. So rather than just beaconing all the time, um, I think you're wasting half the value of APRS. Um, I highly recommend going to the effort of connecting something like APRS Droid or a phone app or something to your APRS system so you can receive packets as well. Uh, that means people can send you messages rather than just trying to call you on the radio. Um, and it also means that if someone's getting close to you or near you and wants to catch up, they can see your position. It's all lots and lots of fun that you're sort of missing out if you're just beaconing your positioning and not listening. So definitely, uh, definitely consider that. Um, APRS also... Uh, opens up a whole bunch of sort of APRS uh, features, such as seeing, sending uh, emails. There's email gateways, there's uh, Twitter gateways, there's Mastodon gateways. There's all sorts of um, things that you can you can uh, interface with with APRS. Um, the other thing we used a lot on our trip was WinLink, and WinLink is essentially email. It's an email gateway. Uh, it lets you send and receive emails. Um, and it's a very, very good system. It's an amazing system and a very good, uh, useful resource. Um, once again, Raspberry Pi, uh, some software called Pat, um, and a HF radio. You will need a modem. We used uh, RDOP, which is an open source modem. Um, and this is super useful for keeping updated with friends and family. Um, the key thing is you need to let friends and family know how this works and that it's, you know, broadcast in clear, anyone can read it, it's not being used for financial gain, you know, all the amateur rules that we we know, um, and also that they don't try to send you, like, a picture or, you know, a file or an attachment so that they can understand that the, you know, emails have to be quite short to be able to reliably receive them. Um, this was, yeah, super useful for us. We kept in update with family using the system. Um, we did a few test emails beforehand with family members so that they understood how it worked and, and that sort of stuff. Um, 
really recommend playing around with Winlink. It's really, really good. Um, oftentimes, we were connecting to like New Zealand's uh, Winlink nodes. Um, they worked really well. Yeah, really, really good system. Um, that's a sort of, you know, typical sort of stuff uses, uh, that you might want to use. Um, but there's also some fun things that we can do while we're while we're overlanding. They don't have to be complicated. Uh, SSTV, always fun. I love uh, SSTV. Um, you can do this with a phone. I'm not sure how many people sort of get hung up with, oh, I need to interface my computer with this and whatnot. No, just stick your phone up to the mic and press play and go. There's a bunch of different apps on Android and iOS. Um, and you can, there's uh, encoders and decoders. Uh, there's a set of standard frequencies, so you can get onto the like a reg um, SSTV skimmer or um, a few other people run SSTV skimmers, so you can get onto those websites. Um, and you can do it as part of your normal sked as well. So, you know, if you're talking to Mark and saying, hey, we saw this cool thing today, you can hold up your phone and show them the cool thing that you saw today. Um, really, really good. Uh, the other thing that we played around with quite a bit on our little CSR trip is VHF HF DigiPD. Now you do have to be careful with this one because you don't want to flood HF APRS with um, with your typical standard city traffic. Um, but if you configure it all correctly um, and you're careful with it, when you're in the middle of nowhere, you can get your um, your radio. I got like a UV ninety eight, I think, fairly cheap radio. You can get it to beacon your car to pick it up, your car to digipeter onto HF, and then it ends up on the HF network. And you can make this two ways as well. Um, so people can message you while you're walking around, that sort of stuff. Uh, it's really, really cool. Um, and it also puts, you know, friends and family at ease to know that, you know, you haven't gotten stuck in a cave or, um, you know, ha haven't returned or whatnot. It's, it's, uh, it's really good and fun. And, it's not too hard to do. It's a little bit fiddly having two radios connected to like one Raspberry Pi. Um, but once you get past that, once it's sort of set up, it works really, really, really well. Um, the other thing I played around with on our little adventure is when linked to social media. Um, so I came up with a little scheme to heavily compress um, these images. Uh, it uses Avif compression, which is used for um, like interframe in videos, but it's a very, very, very compressible format. And it means that I could send it over WinLink. I think each payload was maybe about three kilobytes big and that was sent over, um, yeah, over WinLink and uh, a little gateway server uploaded that onto um, Twitter and now uploads it onto Mastodon. Um, and to give you an idea of like, Avif versus JPEG. Uh, these are the same images, but uh, encoded on the left side with um, Avif, and they're 1.8 uh, kilobytes big, and the JPEG is like 2.1, and it looks a bit blockier. Probably won't come through very well with the zoom compression and the YouTube compression, but I assure you the one on the left looks a lot better. Um, and then there's some like quality of life things that we did with our setup. So uh, we have the radio in the back of our car. It's an ICOM 7100. It doesn't have a waterfall, but waterfalls are nice. So Jordi built a system called Radio Console. It uses an SDR uh, connected to an IF tap to generate a waterfall displayed in the car. Um, but that system kind of got expanded on to include lots of different things and customizations such as buttons. So these buttons ended up being super, super useful because uh, it's just a touch screen in the front of the car and we just touch a thing and it will send a whole bunch of rig control messages to the radio and set it up for a specific mode. So we had a button to change it to WinLink. We had a button to change it to the different APRS DigiPeat modes. We had a button to put it to our our uh, scheduled contact configuration. And we didn't have to worry about configuring the radio, um, you know, by hand and, you know, changing all the knobs and switching it between data mode and not data mode. Um, so it was very, very cool and very, very useful. 
Uh, and it also configured the Raspberry Pi to, you know, start when link up or start die wolf up. It was uh, very useful. Would recommend. And sort of to uh, wrap this up, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that we haven't tried yet and we think would be very, very cool to try. There's lots of things to do and you can sort of just do them while you're traveling. You can do them, you know, while the car's in motion, you can do them while you're parked up and have that nice low noise floor. Um, so things I haven't tried that I think would be cool to try is PSK mail. It appears to be sort of like WinLink, but cut down and uses PSK. Uh, I'm not sure how many nodes there are running, but it looks very interesting. Uh, JS8 core APRS. Um, so there's quite a few JS8 uh, stations now. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see what the coverage would be like with APRS. Um, and it could be a little bit better than uh, what we currently have with Bell 103 modem with no forward error correction and all of that sort of uh, stuff. I think there could be a, quite a big room for improvement with JS8 core. Uh, WinLink location updates. So there is a provision in WinLink to do position updates like APRS. I want to have a look at that at some point. Um, didn't really play around with uh, digital voice, but I think that would be cool. And there's opportunity there for um, sort of getting past some of that HF noise uh, in your car that makes it a little bit annoying to, to listen to someone. Um, but also... Yeah, being able to call someone and, and that sort of stuff, uh, which brings me into like cell call. I know there's a bunch of people on 7045 that use cell call, at least the code in cell call. Um, I think it'd be cool if we had some more open source uh, modulators and demodulators for cell call that uh, uh, that could be quite useful. I want to see more of that and experiment more with that. Um, and another weird one is APRS telemetry. Uh, so you can, in APRS, send a telemetry packet that could be, you know, something weird like engine coolant temperature or, um, you know, what gear you're in or something like that. And it'd be kind of like interesting to pull data from like the car's CAN bus system and then transmit it over the air. Um, completely unnecessary, but I think it would be uh, cool to experiment with. Um, the other thing I want to mention is there's tons of different travel nets. There's... Um, there's lots of nets. If if you just Google nets, there's tons, but there are dedicated travel, traveler ones. Um, there's the like 7045. Often you'll have people traveling with their code in um, 9350s doing their cell calls and that. So that's, um, that's a good frequency to sort of listen to uh, if you're traveling around. Um, but yeah, that's sort of what I had for... Uh, overlanding and amateur radio. Um, thanks for listening. <laughs> uh, this QR code, I believe, goes to these slides. So if you want to look at any of the details from this talk, again, you can scan that. Um, I will try and remember to send links out to people. And yeah, if you have questions, you can also email me or hit me up on Mastodon. Okay, thank you very much, Michaela, for a very interesting talk. I uh, just wonder, is anybody here in the hall got a question? All quiet. Anybody online? Uh, how do we think Starlink will change the the scope of um, remote connectivity and mobile phones? Yeah, that's a good question. So we did this about a year ago. And when we did it, Starlink coverage was just below where we were traveling. Um, so I, I, I think Starlink's definitely going to change some things, um, uh, especially with the the like rooftop mounted um, panels that you can get for the the RVs and stuff now. Um, uh, I think that means that you you could possibly live stream some of these trips, uh, which is really really cool and. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely interesting. Yeah, cool. Okay, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Michaela. Um, anybody else on Zoom got a question? Yeah. Um, firstly, thanks for a really interesting presentation. I um, I only really get to use my radio going out camping now because uh, just nowhere to put antennas in a at home. Um, 
do you take more sort of uh, larger scale antennas with you, like a half wave dipole or something when, for when you set up camp and want to run into the night? Or do you just run off the car verticals or the, the car mounted antennas? Yeah, great question. Um, we live in an apartment here, so uh, we don't get a chance to really do much in terms of um, HF from from our apartment. So we've got an inverted V and a 12 meter spider beam that we um, that we take if we want to do some dedicated like amateur radio -y sort of stuff that's beyond just, you know, scheduled check-ins and that sort of stuff. Um, I think there was probably like three times that we sort of set that up on the CSR trip, but uh, generally, we just use the the vertical on the on the Coda ninety three fifty while we're sort of traveling around in that. Um, and if if the timing's right, um, because your noise noise floor is is so low and you can push out a hundred watts from most of these radios, um, it's not too bad just operating off those. I mean, an inverted V is going to definitely do do better, um, but I've been able to make it over to the to the UK on just the little antenna on the Coda 9350 and 100 watts. So if the band's open, I think the band's open. <laughs> cool, thank you. Hey, um, anybody else on Zoom? Question? Um, Hayden, was there any questions online? Great. Um, Michaela, uh, I had a question. With the uh, that DigiBlock unit, there's a codec on that um, board. Is What's that being used for or intended to be used for? You know, comment on that, please. So that's just the, if we go back to that diagram, this one here. Uh, the audio codec is um, just the fancy way of saying that's the sound card. So it's not doing anything like AMB or anything like that. It's just PCM. So this acts like a normal USB sound card. Um, nothing, nothing too fancy. The CM108 chip is a very common USB sound card. Okay, thanks very much. Um, just uh, one more round. Is there anybody else that's got a question? Oh, one just did pop up on Zoom. Uh, did you say you didn't try PSK mail and what services can you get from amateur satellites passing over? Right. Uh, I haven't tried PSK mail yet. It's on my to-do list. I, um, yeah, I really want to try it out. I'm not even sure if there's any or many uh, PSK mail nodes, but the thing that sort of interests me is some of them, at least in the past, had a um, like a summoning mode, which would be quite useful because... One of the problems with WinLink is all the stations that are at fixed frequencies. So if someone else is using that frequency, you're kind of stuck. You just have to wait for that QSO to finish. And it is really, 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 really frustrating when you're like halfway through sending and receiving an email and someone starts a QSO and you're like, okay, I have to find a different node or something. Um, uh, what was the other question here? Uh, just about amateur satellites, uh, what what services can you get from using amateur satellites? Yeah, um, so I I only usually use the uh, FM sats just because they're super easy to do and don't require too much thinking, and I don't do a lot of thinking while I'm camping. Um, but you, I do know of a few people that have set up their VHF radios to beacon on some of the satellite frequencies, like the ISS APRS frequency and be able to beacon up their position and get it digipeated and receive somewhere else. So you can do that APRS beaconing stuff uh, just, just with VHF and being patient with satellites. You're not going to get the update rate that you do with like the HF 30 meters, but um, it, it does okay. It does surprisingly well, I've been told. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michaela. Uh, thank you, everybody on Zoom. Thank you, everybody is online on YouTube. Thank you, Aiden. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, we'll have a short break, uh, probably uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, just have a bit of a chat. Uh,